The idea that we've got here is each of the implementation teams is going to get a little bit of time to do a, a quick introduction to their project, um, status, aim, a little, maybe a little bit about futures. Um, Kevin, working on Cardinal, um, is going to get a longer um, section. John Lamb, working on Ruby CLR, is going to get a shorter section because he's talking again tomorrow. Evan gets a longer section. Um, and then Charles and Tom, down on the end, get a shorter section because they're also talking tomorrow. Um, once they get through their, uh, their presentations, we'll turn the time over to you guys to kind of drive and ask for questions and get answers from the full panel. So with that, um, why don't we just work down. Kevin, we'll let you go first. Okay. Um, so for the past two years, I've been following uh, Parrot to some degree, actually pretty, pretty closely. And I've worked on a couple different projects. The last one I started was Cardinal. Um, Cardinal today can do simple flow control, uh, simple functions, and it's about right there. We haven't gone much further than that, mostly because I've diverted my attention for the past, I guess, three or four months to kind of helping Parrot finish up. Parrot has a, a object system in place, but it's really a bootstrap. Uh, object system, and we're kind of redoing it. And you can imagine implementing Ruby without an object system is a little difficult. So um, that's where Cardinal stands today. But uh, I'm just very interested in, in virtual machines and um, compatibility and interop between languages. And so that's why my interest is, lies with Cardinal uh, and, and Parrot specifically. Um, Parrot has some really cool things going for it. It has a JIT and uh, and good garbage collection, ready to go. Needs to be polished, but those are nice things to have ready for you. Um, it has an interoperating, interoperating calling convention, so that allows Python, Perl, Ruby to call back and forth between each other, and that's kind of interesting. Um, it has a portable bytecode, um, and we right now run on most of the common platforms out there, um, Intel, Intel 684, um, of course, the AMD stuff. Um, we also run on Mac OS X, both Intel and uh, PowerPC. And uh, every once in a while, we get some people running FreeBSD and some Spark stuff. I don't. That's kind of where I'll leave it for now, and we'll get back. Oh. I'm John Lamb. Um, I talked to some of you guys before at the last RubyConf, uh, you know, about the, the work I've been doing with Ruby CLR. Um, unlike some of the other people here, I can't admit to being a language implementer, um, at least not for another few weeks. And, uh, you know, so I'm going to be, I'm, my, my primary interests here are, are kind of along the lines of understanding the interop problems between dynamic and static languages. Because right? one of the interesting things about the Ruby CLR bridge project, which I created, was the fact that um, CLR types and Ruby types can coexist inside of your Ruby programs and look just like each other. I handle all the marshalling, the conversions, and the interop stuff um, automatically for you, right? So you get this good feel. I even do some other kind of wacky things um, that you'll see, like mangling the names, right, of, of, of CLR methods, right? So, so like a lot of other libraries, there's naming conventions in, in terms of how you name your methods. And, and CLR library naming conventions are nothing like you know, Ruby naming conventions, but yet I allow you to call them and make your apps still look Ruby-ish, right, while, while calling any of these things. So there's a lot of little bits of things that you can do at the interop level beyond just, you know, well, how do I convert, you know, strings, right? How do I convert a mutable string to, you know, an immutable string, right? And those kinds of issues. Um, so those things are taken care of as well. Um, and what's really interesting is some of the stuff that, that Kevin here was talking about with the dynamic language interop problem as well, right? Because if you kind of look back at, at the common language runtime, similar problems kind of exist there as well because it was envisioned from the get-go to be a, um, a static language runtime that would allow multiple static languages to interoperate. So you now have problems, right? Like, okay, let's say you had a library written in C-sharp that you wanted to call from Eiffel, right? Or a library written in Vivi that you wanted to call from C-sharp and those kinds of problems as well. So there are similar problems when you really want to have this kind of base runtime and base set of infrastructure that all of your other stuff can run on top of. Um, and one of the nice things about programming towards a platform like that is the fact that a lot of things just kind of come for free, right? So generally things like debugging support, right, which is a big issue, right, just kind of come for free, right, because the platform supports debugging. Um, so as long as you're emitting the right symbol information, um, you know, you can plug right into Visual Studio or WinDebug or your favorite debugger of choice and, and get the debugging stuff coming along for free. Um, so this is kind of a rambling thing right now. Just come some thoughts to kind of 
at least talk about the problems I'm really interested in getting um, comments and feedback about, right, especially in the various interop scenarios. Because I think those are the really tough problems. You know, if you were to implement a language, say the Iron Python guys, um, you know, if you were to implement a language, part of it is just, yeah, sure, getting language semantics right, but it's the playing well with others that's actually, I think, an even more challenging problem than getting the core language to run and, and, and to run well. Uh, so I'm Evan Phoenix, and uh, I'm sort of the project lead for Rubinius, which is a, uh, a, a brand new Ruby virtual machine that um, the, we've been building from sort of from the ground up. Um, its, uh, its aim is to be uh, 185 compliant, um, and sort of its the big to-do is that it's designed with uh, really uh, Ruby in mind. So uh, only as little of it is actually written in C or any foreign language as possible. So, um, you know, you'll find that basically all of the core library for uh, Ruby, uh, all the methods on array, all of those kinds of things are all implemented directly in Ruby. And um, the VM itself is just a, a slim VM written in C that allows you to basically extend it. So the idea is to really keep it small and keep it simple and provide a VM with tools to build up a whole... Uh, Ruby and implementation on top of it. Um, uh, Goals-wise, um, we're uh, going to hit 1.0 by October. That's uh, our goal is to, is to have 1.0 out by RubyConf this year. Um, and at that point, it will be 100% uh, 185 compliant and run uh, Rails 1.2. So um, those are our, those are our goals. Um, and. Okay, I'm uh, Charlie Nutter from Sun. Uh, hope, anybody here that doesn't know what JRuby is at this point? Well, that's good. Um, so I don't really need to tell you, you know, Ruby on the JVM. Uh, we're moving along as far as milestones go and the details of things. We've got our talk tomorrow. The last talk now, I think it's been shuffled uh, shuffled around to be the, the saving the best for last, right? The finale. So, the finale for the conference. Um, but, you know, we're looking at 1.0 release in the next couple of months. We want it to be faster than MRI, uh, 1.8.5 release. Um, and uh, the last re release we did officially can run Rails now, and we'll have more numbers and talk about that kind of stuff tomorrow. I'm Tom Enabo, another uh, developer of JRuby, and what more can I say? We're going to be giving a talk tomorrow, which we're going to detail stuff a lot more, and... Uh, I'm more interested in what questions people actually have about our implementations, like uh, questions about compatibility or what applications we can run. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, as far as the questions go, ideally all of the questions are going to be um, fairly broad that can be addressed by everything. If, if you really want to drill into the details about a specific implementation, I'd ask that you try and catch one of the implementers during the break or, or one of the other breaks during the day. Um, but if, if it's just a, a light question, yeah, we can, we can probably handle that. Also, Mike Moore has a wireless mic that we'll try and kind of move around. Uh, if you speak up, we'll still try and recap the questions so that we can at least catch it for, um, for video and audio. With that, uh, Carl. Yeah, I just wanted to see if you guys could comment generally on the performance of your implementations. I'll start. Um, has, did anybody see the Ruby shootout that was posted on a blog a couple weeks back, kind of comparing uh, Ruby 185, Ruby 19, the YARV implementation? Um, what else? Cardinal was in there. JRuby was in there. Rubinius was in there. Uh, yeah, Ruby.net was in there as well. And um, I think they left they left a couple out, but they, it was a pretty good good uh, good uh, cross section. Um, our performance in general cases. And JRuby is probably about twice as slow as Ruby. But uh, as I'll show tomorrow, I've got a lot of benchmarks now showing individual cases are starting to run faster at this point, uh, even some in interpreted mode that are running faster. When we start compiling things, things generally go quite a bit faster than, than regular Ruby. So there's more work to do there to get the general cases all running that fast. But all of the work we're doing is generally applicable. We're not focusing on on uh, op optimizing for any specific benchmarks. We've been simplifying our internals quite a bit over the last six, eight months, and 
we slowly see a little bit more performance out of each thing we actually remove from the interpreters. So there's still plenty of run room or runway. Yeah, the big the big challenge for us is trying to get the runtime into a into a shape that the JVM can take over for us. Because if it can find the, if we can get it so that Hotspot or any of the other VMs can optimize it, um, most most people are, are aware of the fact that it can do pretty well and oftentimes beat C code in a lot of cases. Um, so I guess to speak to the shootout, uh, I was just happy. Well, Rubinius was listed on there, and I was just happy that we that you know it passed sixty percent of the tests on there, let alone you know was on there at all. I was really happy to make a really big red bar that made everybody else look awesome too. Um, that being that being said, up to that point, uh, and even now, I mean, it is a very young project, and I actually hadn't done. I specifically I hadn't done any performance tuning uh, zip nada up to that point because, um, in fact, I hadn't even told uh, GCC to do you know any optimizations. I had basically turned off any possible optimization because it just makes it harder to to debug to work on. Um, and uh, so since that time, um, I've decided that well, if people are going to start looking, it's going to be the pub sort of one of those public facing statistics. I should probably put a little time into it. So uh, in the intervening week or so after that, um, I had, uh, you know, I, I tuned it. I got GCC doing the right thing uh, for most of the, the VM. And um, I was actually beating 185 on some of the benchmarks. Uh, of course, they're my benchmarks, so I would hope I do awesome on them. <laughs> that being said, uh, the overall goal is that, I should say for 1.0, if we're as fast as 185 generally, uh, I'll be happy but disappointed. Um, you know, there's a lot of places where uh, the architecture is a lot simpler and a lot, a lot more open for optimization than the current architecture. So um, even if we hit that and it's as fast as 185 for 1.0, the sky's the limit in terms of new optimizations for making the VM faster. So I can't talk about any specifics of uh, implementation of Ruby, but I could talk about um, Iron Python um, that runs on top of CLR, which is a similar dynamic language. And you know, Iron Python right now is the fastest Python implementation out there. Um, it's depending on whose benchmark you care to believe and, and that kind of stuff. Um, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.6 times faster than C Python. Um, and the goal really is to make it just faster, right? It's not because it's going to be an arms race ultimately, right, to, to continue to look for more interesting optimizations that can happen. But I think it kind of proves out a lot of the, the kind of features of the CLR as a platform for trying to make stuff go fast, right? And one of the most interesting features, which I'll talk a lot more about tomorrow, is this thing called a dynamic method. And dynamic methods are little chunks of code that you can compile, but that are also garbage collectible as well. So for dynamic languages, right, that's really, really important because, you know, you will generate a whole bunch of little stubs of code that at some point in time you're going to throw away. Um, because they're invalid, right? So things like, you know, how you would go off and cache methods, right? Method invocations for future use. Um, so you don't have to go running around looking up method names at runtime. Those are really interesting ripe opportunities for exploiting that feature to make stuff go fast as well. So, you know, so that just gives you some idea about, at least, you know, in the Python world, you know, where, where things stand. Yeah, so it's really early and, and benchmarks are deceiving, but um, on some benchmarks where Parrot is jitting and we write static code, Parrot is able to compete with C or beat C um, runtimes, um, mostly compete. But I, I think even the Java guys can say that too, is that if you jit and you're doing uh, very static things, there's no reason why we can't compete. On another note, uh, what little Perl 5 to Parrot comp, um, comparison has been made, we're seeing generally a speed up of um, at least twice as fast, sometimes as much as five times as fast as Perl if it runs on Parrot. Now, there are exceptions all over the board, but the, th the note is, is that jitting makes a difference, and uh, there's no reason why we can't all, I think, just, you know, deliver a good performance. Okay, great. Anyone next? Any hands? Era. Era. If I can, yeah, yeah we'll try so, and recap so, that. So, Pat's going to repeat. Oh. 
whatever. If you uh, like just w sort of what language features are the most difficult. I well, just to to, to jab, you know, because we're on a panel, so we're supposed to jab a little bit. So to jab, I found continuations to be one of the easiest. But that's because the architecture that Rubinius is built on was built in such a way that everything is first class, and therefore continuations took an afternoon. So um, what is hard? Um, what is hard uh, is, at least uh, for me, for the most part, what's ended up being hard is really, well, let's see, language features that you're asking about. Um, I mean, I, everybody will say a dynamic dispatch is a pain, but, and that, that's, but that's a fundamental language feature, I'm not sure. Um, uh, one, one, one area that's been tough for us in uh, JRuby is emula emulating Ruby's threading model, which allows you to do a lot of illegal things when you're actually dealing with real threads, like kill. You can't kill real threads safely. Uh, or, or just, Stop. I'm thinking, uh, eval is actually a biggie in comparison, because if for those who were around in the 1.6 days to 1.8 days, the semantics of eval have evolved over the years, and you know eval has all of these special cases involved where it's supposed to actually manipulate the calling environment so you have to leave things open so that eval can come back and screw stuff up under the covers because that's what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, e eval is an interesting challenge for, uh, for those of us trying to compile things down to bytecode because we don't want to compile every single eval necessarily and have a whole bunch of wasted time spend, spent compiling, which is the reason that in JRuby we've kind of decided that we're going to have a mixed mode interpreter, mixed mode engine. So it'll interpret sometimes, it'll jit to Java bytecode sometimes, but then we get a good balance between what's really, what we really want to optimize and what's just transient code. So eval definitely makes it a little more complicated. And, and this isn't a specific problem, but we've found that it's really easy to implement a particular function and then realize like three months later that there's some really weird esoteric feature that no one's ever used in real software, but then one person did, so... Now I have to go back and fix it, and well, there's just so many corner cases. The, you know, and to, to speak to that, um, there's, you know, one of those very esoteric features is the what can be taken as the uh, a block argument, and mm -hmm. if you go look in the standard library, pretty much everything takes a, a local variable. Some it takes just the name of some local variable to use. But if you go look at the actual parser and the runtime, that thing that can be there is in a, an enormous number of possibilities that no one has ever used. And you know, to, to actually to make it good, you know, I, I know that uh, Charles and I went back and talked to Matt about it. He's like, "Yeah, that was stupid. We're going to take it out. Don't worry about it." So you know, there's give and take already from from the panel back to Matt's to you know, move the language forward. So I've only seen this once in a test. How many people have actually explicitly passed in nil as a block argument? Okay. Nil as a block argument? No, I mean like, like, ampersand, like ampersand nil, nil for, for a, a block argument. Awesome. Okay, yeah. So there's, there's the one guy. I was or there's the two <laughs> guys. <laughs> Be glad Zed's not here. And that, that was a fix we had to make recently. That, what the hell is that piece of code? Yeah, it, okay, it, could, well. it could be that there's a great use case. It's just when I've actually looked audited software, I haven't seen anything explicitly do it. Though, it's part of, um, if you call super in certain conditions. Yeah, that's yeah, where that's we've where seen we it. it Z-Super, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, on that thing, a little bit more on the kind of continuations kind of rat hole that almost always shows up in any discussion about implementing this stuff on top of at least a, a static VM. You know, most of the tricks that, that people play to make that kind of stuff happen and wind up using the exception mechanism, right, to deal with flow control, right, which is generally just, a, you know, the other guys on the CLR team just laugh at us anytime, you know, we, we any kind of thing, you know, comes floats to, to try and use exceptions for flow control. Um, but unfortunately, right, you know, without radical changes to the actual um, CLR itself, right, there's no way to make that happen. And there's actually been investigations that have been done um, to fairly serious investigations to see whether or not this could actually happen. And for the most part, it's been, no, we can't do that without compromising performance of existing languages. And that's just a, it's a, it's a scenario that you can't make, right? You've got languages that run fine on, on top of your, your, your platform, and you can't make them run slower to support this one esoteric feature, right, that, you know, some chunk of the community wants, so. They, I don't know what F Sharp actually uses for that. Yeah. So, so here, to take another poll, well, this is good. Go for Because I can poll and find out whether or not I should even bother doing things. Um, <laughs> 
Who here has ever used retry inside a block? Inside, not inside an exception handler. Inside a block. Yes. Who, who here knows what it does? <laughs> yeah, who here knows what it does? <laughs> there's, there's, there's a couple. Yeah. It, it, it reruns, reruns the method that mm. called the block. The That's method the where block. the block was defined. It goes all the way back out and, re, and recalls that method and yeah. reevaluates its arguments. Right. So it, it does this really crazy, almost really what you would call a continuation of the method that you're already in and kind of tries to backtrack and do it all over again. It's, but no, I don't think it's anyone... A ha- it's a bad idea. Yeah, exactly. No, it's, it's, it, it, it never yeah, works. Yeah. It never, there's no good use case for it. And so, I, I mean, I've never seen it work. And again, to, you know, to use the standard library as a, a fairly, not necessarily the, the best body of code, but a fairly wide one that everyone's aware of, doesn't use it. So, okay. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I think something that Charles might have hinted to, but maybe you're not aware of, is that Ruby is an interpreter. And um, most languages can deterministic, ter- deterministically parse. And one of the f- problems we've seen with Ruby, which is, I think, scheduled to get cleaned up, is that there are times during parse, at parse time, you can't tell whether this is you know, a local variable or a block, you know, that type of thing, until you actually start evaluating. And that can be a real pain for people who are trying to actually compile the bytecode. Yeah, that's actually a, it's kind of a legacy in, in the C implementations parser that's, yeah. that doesn't need to be there. We've modified our parser to, to truly lexically scope those variables so we oh, don't have okay. that problem cool. anymore. And it can be done. So. Yeah. But that's an example, I think, of some yeah. of weird things like, wow. Well, see, that's, that's kind of the interesting detail about this, trying to figure out what these hard features are and how to implement them. Um, we don't have any spec for what the behavior is supposed to be. So the mo- easiest way is to read through the way Ruby did it and do it that way. And then after, you know, what a year of really hitting the JRuby code hard, we figured out, oh, they meant this. <laughs> so we could do it the right way for our platform and not have to do it the, you know, not, the, not necessarily the wrong way, but the way that doesn't work well for but, what we're doing. But that is an interesting point. You can do things the wrong way, and it's amazing how much Ruby software will continue to work. Yeah. We didn't even have lexically scaled variables for a while, and nothing broke for a long time. <laughs> a long time, yeah. All right, next question. I just had a general kind of question. Being new to this space is in a lot of spaces, I guess. Um, what other advantages does it give you using your collected products other than speed? I know we've addressed speed a lot. What other advantages does using your individual products give give to the Ruby developer or deployment? I'll start. I think interop. Um, whenever you start a new language, the first thing you have to write after you get your language done is an Apache uh, attachment, a MySQL attachment, a Postgres attachment. And, and there's just... Half of the, w- the wealth of languages is the library that comes with them. And so I think a lot of us are trying to, at least the .NET and Java guys are trying to exploit the runtime. I can be the bad sheep. That's fine. Uh, what? I can be the black sheep. Yeah. That's fine. There's one I left out. Take your guess. No. Um, so I think interop is a big thing. Um, we don't want to have to rewrite the world every time we want to do something in Ruby. I would say... Um, Kind of other kind of broader platform features like debugging support, profiling, code coverage. Um, be interesting to think, imagine what kind of static analysis tool would actually be useful for a language like Ruby. But you know, those kinds of things, right, are things that more or less kind of come for free. Um, you could also imagine with the right type inferencing engine, um, you might even get things like code completion slash IntelliSense support inside of IDEs and things, right? So that you know, again, you don't have to reinvent the giant wheel um, in order to get that stuff. And I think, but for me, I think the big one is getting a, a first-class debugger in this stuff. You know, so you can actually go off and, and deal with problems, especially if, let's say, you deployed an application out to a customer and that thing breaks out there. It's, it's, you know, what do you do with the dump that you get back from the other thing to, you know, from the customer to try and figure out what the bug was? But, you know, to speak to reinventing the world, you know, if you will, uh, you know, the at least in my case, it's uh, well, what do you want to do? Because the the everything being first class, the virtual machine is very open to the point that um, if you really feel like it, it's perfectly valid to uh, go in, grab the compiled method object for the method you're running right now, and rewrite the bytecode mid mid stream if you want. If you feel like you know what, I could optimize this right here, I could do it. Or say you uh, you know maybe you want to write a, a really nice debugger, say 
something that comes from maybe like the small talk world. You're able to actually go in and say, all right, everything's first class. I'm going to go back and I want to actually print me out the current byte codes that were being run at the time. Print me out X, Y, and Z other things. So it's really it's a platform for – because uh, my goal is to build a platform for other people to work because I can't – I mean – me and you know, there's probably about 10 people on the Rubinius team right now. Won't simply won't can't fill the void of things that people need in terms of uh, Ruby tools. And so my my goal is to build the tool that they can actually extend it with. So, well, I guess the answer to this is uh, how many folks have worked or currently work in a place where Java is being used. Yeah. See, that's that's kind of the big answer is that it's really just about everywhere. And uh, I guess the other half of it is just the Java ecosystem, all of the libraries. Basically, anything you want to do, there's a couple libraries for it, and maybe one of them's good. Uh, but we've also got one of, I'd say, one of the two best fully functional VMs uh, in the world. It's nice of you to say that about yeah, me. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you know... It, there's been hundreds of man months, man years, whatever you want to measure it as, uh, put into garbage collection and jitting and thread management and everything else on the JVM. So there's a lot more than just performance that we get out of it. We get really a fully functional machine that we can run Ruby on. Just to speak a little more on Charlie's point, how many people um, have a hard time getting Ruby deployed in your work environment? And how many of those people have Java? So, okay. <laughs> well, I, I actually wah, expected that wah. most of the people here would actually be using Ruby at work, so yeah. I didn't expect uh, everyone to raise their hand. I can't use Ruby, but I'm flying to a Ruby conference. Uh, how, how many would like Ruby to be faster? <laughs> but, yeah. I guess, that, you know, one interesting point to, to speak to, to speak to that is, uh, you know, the deployment question. You know, as, as it started to grow up, um, there's been uh, some work and not a lot of work done in the deployment field of, uh, you know, of actual Ruby programs. You know, uh, Eric brought it up this morning about, okay, I want to write a Ruby application. How do I get it out to a customer who doesn't? He, they don't care that, you know, in the same way that, you know, you used to be, or you still can write a program in Fortran and give it to somebody, and they don't have to know you wrote it in Fortran. Uh, you know, how can we get to that point with Ruby? And so those deployment questions, I think everybody here is. It's really on the top of there. You know, it's one of the, the main features about how do we really address that properly. Um, we've got time for probably two, maybe three, if they're short questions. So, I wonder how your implementations deal with Unicode. Go. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we've actually kind of retrofitted Ruby's or uh, JRuby's string to sort of match regular Ruby string behavior for 1.8 compatibility, but uh, the political way that we have decided to support Unicode is that we will have a native version of the Rails multibyte library by default. So it'll be basically the same library, and we won't be forking away from regular Ruby at all, but uh, we'll, have, we'll be able to leverage what Java provides for Unicode. And, and since we can actually pull in Java classes, if you really have some need to actually go out and call into Java, yeah, you, can you just get use, everything. You can just code. use Java's string and everything else that you want to at this point. But yeah, trying to trying to follow the, the Rails method of adding it as a plug-in to Ruby, uh, and then in the future when it's part of the main string API, we'll just support it directly. Um, I don't have it, uh, but I want to. Um, <laughs> Is that I, an invitation? I know, hmm? Is that an invitation for someone to start writing? Absolutely. Um, and I, I, you know, to that end, I've actually left the door open in the implementation. Uh, the the string objects in Rubinius have built in something that isn't currently being used. But not only do they have just uh, you know, in Rubinius, not to get too far into details, a string object is actually just has um, f five slots. So that an object just has slots for the most part in Rubinius. And one of those slots is basically a byte array where all the actual data is stored. But the two slots, there's two slots in there that aren't being used, and that's the encoding and how many characters are actually in that encoding. And those currently are just, we're cheating for the most part. We just fill those in with, the, the, the last field is the number of bytes actually in the byte array. So eventually the idea is that we'll actually move towards 
properly generating how many characters there are based on what that encoding field says. I'm not technically implementing right now. So. <laughs> um, Parrot supports Unicode. I haven't really gotten into it in Ruby. I mean, I think we could follow kind of what the Java guys are doing, kind of fold it in on our own until there gets to be a formal specification. But it's not that hard to make work most of the time today. Next. At RubyConf, there was talk of having a sort of a new website developed for a formal specification for Ruby, and Matt was going to help out with that. And I was just wondering if that ever went anywhere, if there's that, progress. That, it's, it's still running on the box in my basement. Um, and <laughs> it, it gets occasional contributions. Uh, the, uh, the biggest one was probably a number of folks that contributed to a, a binary spec for marshalling, which helped us a heck of a lot trying to implement marshalling. And um, really, just trying to get more and more people on it. It's, it's at hedius.com, H-E-A-D-I-U-S, and then slash Ruby spec. And it's just a media wiki wiki, because that's what I'm used to. And, you know, go in there and update whatever. It's got a little bit of stuff on basic language things. There's a few libraries that have a little bit of implementation detail. Um, there's a little bit of what I've gleaned from internals, like uh, how threading works, how marshalling works, stuff like that. But it's trying to... Uh, sort of be a community spec for Ruby, which is really, I think, the only way we can get to that point right now. Nobody's going to volunteer to do it, so. And I don't know if it's time to be like, you know, what the Python folks have done, right, where they have a foundation which actually owns all the intellectual property around, you know, the spec, the tests, and, and all that kind of stuff. It's much more formal over there, right, in terms of how those guys do things. And, and the foundation itself accepts and rejects things, right, based on that. And there's members, and there's a panel, and there's all this kind of stuff. That's a pretty heavyweight process, but um, but maybe I don't I don't know if it's the right time to really kind of talk about those kinds of things, right? Of trying to formalize what all that really means and where all the IP lives, um, because you guys aren't bound by the same same kind of rules of engagement that Microsoft is, right? It's ridiculous actually how hard it is to contribute to things that aren't Microsoft things, right? I blame the lawyers. I guess the biggest thing is that. Uh, there's nobody really clamoring for a spec except the five of us on the stage and a few others around the world that are trying to do the implementations, which is a, a very small part of the Ruby world in general. Most people just consider pickaxe the spec, and there's so much that's not in there. So, And for the most part, uh, everybody up here is, you know, in fairly, not constant communication, but most of us talk, you know, on at least a weekly basis. So none, you know... Since we're the main ones that are interested, that, that's, you know, the discussion amongst the group is where most of the energy goes. If we had more time, I think we'd be doing it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I'll take some donations to do it. <laughs> if anybody, we can get a hat. Anybody have a I, We could pass the hat if you want. Yeah. All right, it looks like Ed's got a question. I think Can you repeat uh, the question? So, uh, uh, what about a common benchmark suite? Um, well, yeah. I think uh, g given a... So the benchmarks that were on the, the Ruby Shootout benchmark blog were Yarv's benchmarks, which is why Yarv did so awesome. Um, but I think what probably will happen is that that set of benchmarks will probably evolve over time because the JRuby guys will have their own benchmarks and I'll have my own benchmarks and CLR will have its own benchmarks and Parrot will have its own benchmarks and eventually we'll all want to, I mean we all, you know, we're, we're basically competing for the most part. So we'll all want to run each other's benchmarks eventually. So I think it's just a matter of time before in the individual benchmarks for an implementation become some sort of main benchmark. Sweet. And this is actually one thing that we've kind of addressed with um, uh, just unit testing and, and feature, feature testing. We are now running uh, Ruby's tests, uh, Rubicon, the old Ruby test stuff that was written to develop the Pickaxe book, uh, the Ruby underscore test suite, BFTS, Rails unit tests, um, you know, everything that we can find just to have some sort of comprehensive test suite. And it's not you know, coherent what's actually happening and stuff's getting retested and we're testing things multiple times across those, those different uh, sets of libraries. But 
that is kind of our complete test suite. And as everybody in develops their own independent benchmarks, we can start pulling it together into a Ruby bench project and maybe start getting some commonality there. There is actually also another advertisement here, the Ruby tests project on Ruby Forge, which is an attempt to try and pull a lot of those test libraries together. Uh, we've, com com we've contributed a whole bunch of JRuby's tests to it. Uh, we're cleaning up some of the old Rubicon stuff. We were, we were going to have BF BFTS, it's kind of an external link now at this point, trying to have this, this common group of people like implementers and like people who really like writing tests, whoever they are, um, <laughs> actually contribute on the same pool of, of tests. And a, a Ruby bench project, I think it's come up a couple times and there's probably, it's probably the right time for it since performance is foremost on most people's mind now. I'd say spec or no, it's impossible to actually work on an implementation without having a reasonably large body of tests. So, I would say like perhaps a conformance test suite would be more useful than a you know benchmark test suite. To be honest, right? Like because because those are the interesting corner cases to get right. Mm -hmm. um, if I can just add to that, since I was involved in part of some early, early testing stuff and and we've talked about doing some combination. Um, we're also looking at using the Fire Brigade um, project that Eric Hodel and, and Zen Spider put together. Um, if you don't know what it is, it's essentially a mechanism whereby anybody can download, build, and test all of the gems or any of the gems and submit um, pass-fail information, runtime or running speed information, etc. cetera. Um, the, the idea at this point is that we're going to take several of the very popular gems um, and use those as a common set of tests, both benchmarking and conformance tests, and can go back and help the gem writers make sure that they have very good coverage of, of those most popular gems. So um, that reminded me, because we were talking about specs and tests and stuff, um, at RubyConf uh, in Denver, there was discussion about, um, well, don't we have a spec, really? I mean, isn't the current body of work the spec? So shouldn't what currently exists in the wild uh, really encompass the spec? And um, now that I think about it, and that, that's something we might get m back into more. You know, if you go and you, you know, you go through Rails and you go through all the common, you know, all the most popular gems and you go through all the standard library, you know, there's a there's an argument to be made for saying whatever is in those things is the spec. And that to go outside of that, we need some real proof based on that. You know, and so there's, I'm mainly talking, so I remember to do it later. But all right, it's uh, it's quarter after. I think we can handle one short question, and then we'll let go for a break and be back at 2:30. Any, any short questions? Any short questions? Okay. Uh, Era. Go for it. One thing I've always wondered, and I mean, I've never done anything like this, so I have no idea, but why not compile to C? Louder. Why not generate C? I mean, is, are there obstacles in the design of the language to doing that? Because other languages have taken that approach. I mean, you spew out C and you get speed and interoperability overnight, right, with everything. So, so uh, I'll, I'll Go speak. Ahead. Okay. Um, there's, so... Uh, our goal is actually partially partially to that end. Um, the original prototype for Rubinius was written all in Ruby, and so it just ran this new Ruby interpreter on the existing one. So it was incredibly slow. But it just it was really it was me formalizing the idea and making sure that it was really gonna. If I couldn't get the prototype written, I wasn't gonna start writing a whole bunch of C code. Um, and we've actually started. I, I wrote a tool that we're currently not using that actually gener generates C code from a subset of Ruby. And I, I know that um, uh, Ryan and Eric have done the same. Um, the question is, can you do it for a general, an entire, set, not just a generalized subset, but entire the, the entire set of Ruby code? Um, you you sort of can. I mean, if you were to take the model of, say, you want to generate Ruby so that it looks like what Objective-C looks like and kind of move from there. You could probably get pretty far, but there's a lot of things that just don't map. And um, the amount of time and effort that people... There's, there have been two, three projects to that end so far 
that have sort of stalled in the water for the most part. The, pro- the body of work and the amount of dynamicism is just pretty much is really too big to fit within a normal C runtime for the most part. You need to have all, what happens is that you start to do it and then you're like, oh, okay, well, we need to be able to have some way of adding all these methods to it. And, okay, let's do that. And, oh, you know, I'd really be able to like to save this thing. Okay, let me just save this. And, you know, a year down the road, you basically have got 1.8 re-implemented. So, um, yeah. I think the short answer is static dynamic, there's a complete different feature set and it's impossible to do. Um, if you're going to write uh, any of these dynamic languages in C, you can do it, but you really end up with a virtual machine runtime that does interpretation. You, you, can't, there, you can't do a direct mapping across. So if you, the answer to the question, yes, it's MRI. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I, I don't know. I wouldn't go that far, right? Because if you take what Iron Python today compiles down to static assemblies, and, you know, so you could just run these set of static assemblies and their libraries, right, that they have dependencies on um, through the, the engine ahead of time compiler, right, that's, that's inside of, you know, the, the CLR so that you could essentially generate x86 binaries of these things. So, so we're not going to go to C, right, but go straight into x86 code, let's say, right? And uh, if you think of C as a portable assembly language, why not, right? But, but what, what ends up happening is, and, you know, Charlie and I were talking about this earlier today, um, there are cases where... Uh, if you sat down and you're like, okay, I'm going to ha- write a program that takes this Ruby code in and output C, and I'm going to write a big C utility library to augment whatever you know functionality is missing in C, a lot of times if you do that basically AOT ahead of time, you're going to end up with it being a lot slower than if you were to exploit the fact that you're dynamic and that you can learn from multiple runs of the product and actually do JIT. And, uh, you know, that's... So nothing new under the sun wise people tried doing this before you know they've done this with a lot of other languages and what a lot of it ended up doing was saying you know what this is kind of slow if we do it ahead of time you know we've got all this great really rich information at runtime how can we just compile at runtime and then we're back to where we are today so for the most part so the profile guided optimizations right it's one of these things that people have done a lot of lip service to but you know, to my knowledge, there aren't any significant commercial implementations of anything, right, that have significant, you know, profile guided optimizations. There's, um, there's a variety of research tools and those kinds of things for doing, you know, basic block rearrangement and memory and that kind of stuff, right, to try and fit adjacent chunks of code into the cache lines and that kind of stuff. But, you know, still, even with all of the, the amount of brain power that's been expended on this, it still hasn't reached a commercially produced thing that people have used. So I, I don't know. Like, not, not to say that the idea isn't without merit, right? It's just that it's just a much harder thing to really get going than I think it appears to be. I guess for us, uh, I don't want to implement or wire in a garbage collector. I don't want to implement or wire in a machine, a virtual machine or a register machine or whatever else. Um, I don't want to implement the boundary between the libraries, all that stuff's basically there in the JVM and hundreds of people put time in on it. I'll just make it as close to that as possible and let them worry about the the issues of garbage collection and threading and network I.O. and everything else. Uh, Kind of push the problem off on people who are writing general purpose VM stuff to run a lot of different things and, uh, and just concentrate on how I can make it work as well as possible on that platform. But just to be clear, though, right, like when I said ahead of time compilation, right, that's not compiling down a native x86 code that runs without the CLR installed on the machine, right? So this is still x86 code that's still run managed under the CLR, that's still using CLR JIT. And, well, not the JIT, but CLR GC. But, it, but and it's still using, it, but it uses basically 70 megs of utility library as well. It's Potentially, not, right? Depends on what you're using. Right? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, right. But so, I mean, you know, the amount of, t- you know, you, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what more I can say. What a wonderful <laughs> note. Um, okay, that, that gives us about 10 minutes before we need to get back. Um, thank you guys for coming out and, and taking some time. And, and